much for taking the time away from your day to be here this evening. We first like to, to honor our gracious hosts this evening, Mary Evelyn Dixon. We do appreciate you on behalf of the school district for allowing us to conduct this meeting here tonight. And without further ado, I will allow the mayor to come. She has another e engagement this evening. So let's be cognizant of her time and allow her to approach the podium to give a brief greeting as she will have to depart momentarily. And then we'll turn it over to Superintendent Dr. Morsey's J. Beasley. Just to go read something else, ain't she? <laughs> First of all, getting honor to the Spirit of Christ who's the head of my life. I'm in my building, so I can say that. And he's my everything. Um, it is with deep honor and pleasure that I invite Dr. Beasley, administration, counselors, and everybody to this meeting tonight. Uh, I must say that Dr. Beasley was so gracious when I called him. I said, Doc, forgive me, but that's what I called him. I'm older than him, so I can do that. I say, the Lord laid it on my heart. We gotta stop saying what the problem, what the problems are. Go out in the community and do something about it. We're gonna open it up here where they can come, parents, educators, or whoever, and let's talk with the superintendent. Because we perish for a lack of knowledge. We really do. And I thought this would be great. Oh, but let me tell you, they just had this on Channel 2 News. I didn't do that. I don't know who did it, but thank you. <laughs> Hopefully somebody will come. And I said, Lord, if only five or six come, that's a victory. If we can educate just a few of them and they spread the word. Uh, so I, I must, sir, I must admit, every principal that I spoke with was elated and wanted to participate. And I must say that Sequoia Hopper, Riverdale Elementary, North Clay Middle and High School, um, and Drew, none of those schools are in my area. Those schools are under the commission. But I adopted those schools. So whatever I do for Riverdale High, Riverdale Middle, and Church Street, for giving scholarships, Ms. Gurry has passed them out for me. Uh, last year I was not able to attend because I was having surgery. But she did it in my stead. We passed out... Um, scholarships and trophies, not to the smartest student or the student who's getting all the awards, but to the student who pulled themselves up by the bootstrap to motivate and encourage them. And since I've been married, some of them have gone on to finish trade school, college, and have careers, and they, the best gift you can get in the world is when a child make it and call you back and say thank you. Money just can't cover everything. It made me forget I didn't have a husband. I was just happy. But doctor, thank you for coming. Thank you for opening up your heart to even want to do this. And Miss Jessica Rhea is over this area from the school board and she's constantly in the community working and everything. But I must bow and tip my hat to you, principals, teachers, counselors, and everything, because now your hands are so tied in the classroom as far as discipline and doing everything, and a child can lie out his ear, and they're going to believe that child, knowing they lying like an alibi. And what can you do? Look at the, and the reason I'm so gun ho about this is there was a, a teacher at Southwest DeKalb, lost his family, his money, and everything. And eventually the girlfriends came up and said she lied because he wouldn't go with her. Well, how are you going to go back and recapture 
all that you've lost. Now, there's some people like that doing some stuff. We ain't gonna lie. But I admire you to get up every day. As my grandpa said, every day. And go. I'm from the hood, y'all. So when I see stuff peripherally, I'm looking. <laughs> I don't sit with my back to net. I'm looking at both sides to see what's going on. But welcome to this meeting tonight. I pray that some parents come. I see administration is turning out really well. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you, because you don't, no offense to you, administration is super Y'all don't make no money back for what the job you have to do. Like my firemen and policemen don't make no money for putting their lives on the land. But we will pay somebody five hundred dollars to go see JC, and he can't even sing. He can't even rap to me. But people pay that money. You pay for what you're interested in. I heard my grandpa say once: people will pay for what they want and beg for what they need. They'll pay to go see a concert, but beg to get a free book for their children to go for. So I'm gonna head on over here to the meeting. So I'm, I'm going to rush them dudes real fast so I can try to catch this before it's over. But again, thank you so much for coming. If anybody ever want to know, if anybody respect and love y'all, tell them Mayor Evelyn Wynn Dixon, not because my daughter is a facilitator, but from what I see every day and what I hear on the news and what I see. And one last thing. We need to do something about our judicial system with the children because we're making them entitled. Because my police officer arrested one little guy. He said, I don't know what you're arresting me for. I'll be out by the time you get out for dinner. And guess what? He went out. And you know what? That's not teaching them consequences for their actions. They feel like they're invincible and can do whatever and don't nothing matter. But if you don't see technology and all these things are growing now, they're going to be a lost generation. And if you don't go vote, 17,000 people was dropped from Clayton County alone because they hadn't voted since the President Obama was ill. So I thought I'd drop that for free. But anyway, I'm about to go. Um, I don't hug just about everybody, but you know I'm, I'm a country girl. I'm going to let you go. Who I get in my phone to? You ain't on the program. I was all over I ain't getting you this mic. I ain't getting you this mic. Jesse is a B U L L Y. Teach your children. Teach, teach your children about bullies. Thank you, Mayor Dixon. See you all give Mayor Dixon a hand clap of praise. Anyway, I'm going to invoke <laughs> the Jesse Gorey rules because we're in Jesse Gorey territory here. <laughs> I want to uh, <laughs> welcome everyone to the great city of Riverdale. This is the greatest of the seven cities in Clayton County. And I, that's correct. And I want to thank all of the administrators from uh, District three that are here at, at this meeting, and if you don't mind, could I could all the principals and administrators and employees of the Clay County Public Schools please stand, please? Thank you all so much. Uh, we have thank you all so much. I wanted to let you all stand up because we do have some constituents here, and I want you all to see how dedicated our administrators are that they're here after their working hours to meet the public. It is, just, it is my pleasure, I want to come, since we're in my district, and anytime we're in my district, whether you all have me on the program or not, I'm going to come and speak, because it's my district. And so anyway, I wanted to, I personally wanted to introduce you all to the superintendent of Clayton County Public Schools, Dr. Morsi's Beasley, although I know I've got to work on that, your name, because you just told us that's not the correct pronunciation. But uh, I want to welcome him, because he is a man that is committed to high performance. That's what our theme is. 
He's a man that's committed to the children of Clayton County Public Schools. And he is the hardest working superintendent in the educational field because you all know I support everything in the county, but he has worn me out. And I have not been able to attend everything. I even had to get his wife's telephone number on son yesterday because we're going to have to slow him down a little bit because we're worn out. But anyway, without further ado, I want to introduce you to the first and only superintendent that I have ever voted yes for. And you know we've been through about four or five. So that should tell you something right there. Dr. Morsi's Beasley, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Gory. Ms. Gory is somebody in to see you all. Thank you, Ms. Gory. It's just good to be here in Riverdale. We acknowledge Mayor Wynn Dixon for this opportunity. Thank you all for being here on tonight. To all of our principals that are here, I know you've had a long day, but thank you for being here and, and employees that are here, our uh, senior staff and others that are here. Just thank you. And to our parents, parents, wave, wave your hand so I can see where you are. Very good. Thank you all. Because I know you've got to get home, do homework, and everything else, but hopefully the, the food back there will make it a little easier for you to, uh, once you leave here, to go and just get them ready for bed, right? Um, you're welcome. Well, thank you all for being here on today. And our goal is not to hold you very long, but to give you an opportunity to hear about what our areas of focus are um, and to give you a chance to share. We'd like to, at, at some point, uh, open up the mic and give you a chance to share, you know, what's working, what's not working, feedback for us to consider as we work toward improving things. But before I get started, I just want to make sure we, we introduce the, uh, the senior team, the ones that report directly to me. And I'll just start with those that I see. I see Dr. Smith, second in command, deputy superintendent in the back there. I see Rod Smith, uh, IT chief. I see Jada Dawkins, whose team has worked to organize tonight. Uh, over communications. I see Dr. Sandra Nunez, our Deputy Superintendent for Student Support Services and Federal Programs. Our new Chief of HR of Human Resources, Dr. Jamie Wilson. I see Dr. Ralph Simpson, our Deputy Superintendent for School Leadership and Improvement. He supervises all schools. Um, let's see, I see Mr. Wendell Speeb over there, our Chief for Engagement, Governmental Relations, and Partnerships. I just want you to know that these individuals, we're here to serve you, clearly, your principals. And I want all the principals, if you would stand, just one more time, principals. Your principals are here, and our principals, the hardest job in America. You can't please everybody, but somehow they managed to get everything done for the benefit of our children. So we have acknowledged them all today. Any other employees here? I think I met a counselor today. Uh, Mr. Counselor, Counselor, very good. Good to have you all here on today. We appreciate all of you. So very quickly, let's just go through the, uh, the five areas of focus. And they're on the screen for you, and I won't read them verbatim to you, but I'll just basically highlight the five areas that we have. The first area is related to instruction, where we're working to create very academically challenging and safe classroom environments in every classroom and every school, period. You can talk about improvement for many years, but if you are not improving the quality of instruction in every classroom, then you probably will not only improve, but you will not sustain your improvement. It's the quality of instruction that results in improved student achievement. Our goal is to eliminate what we call the variability. We have some teachers, many teachers that are teaching high quality. We've got a few that are here. We've got to eliminate that gap everybody at a high level of quality. And so you'll see a very consistent, sustained effort to improve the quality of instruction in every school, in every classroom. In every school and in every classroom. And one way we do that is by ensuring that we hire and we get rid of all the vacancies that we've had. We've had about 250 vacancies over the last three to f f five years and we're down to 73, I believe it is, this year. Not down to zero yet, but 73 is a whole lot better than 200 and what? 50. And so we're making progress. Uh, and our goal is to, is to really, we're dealing with the national shortage of teachers. And as a, one of the largest districts in the nation, we are in the, tops, uh, the, the top size district, the, the largest 100. We're at number, I want to say 87 or something like that. So clearly, if there's a shortage, being one of the largest districts in the 
nation and in the metro area, we would have to deal with that. But we're working to mitigate that shortage and we're being very uh, intentional and we're recruiting aggressively. But now we're not just recruiting, but we're working to retain our teachers. And that's important. Once we, re once we grab them and they sign and they commit to coming to our school district, and then we provide support and training. We got to retain these teachers. And so I often say, and the staff and others have heard me in other sessions, retention is everybody's business. Recruitment is everybody's business. We've got to show appreciation to our teachers, don't we? If you expect to keep them in Clayton County, you better show appreciation because if you don't, somebody else will, and your children will be sitting with subs while their children have great teachers. And that's why I tell people, the superintendent has a responsibility, my team has a responsibility, our principals, inclusive of my principals on my team have a responsibility, but guess who else has a responsibility? Parents. Oh, yes you do. You got to find a way to work with teachers and show respect for what they're doing in that classroom every day. And like Mayor, when Dick, uh, Dixon said, you know, I know we want to believe our children, but you don't want to believe them when they're not telling the truth. And then you don't want to go up there and be rude to teachers. And I'm telling you, there are some school systems that won't allow that. You know why? Because they know that they don't retain teachers that way. And so we're creating a culture where we want to show support, respect for our teachers, realizing that if we don't hold on to our teachers, we can't get upset when they sit with subs all day. So we're working to retain our teachers. So the first area is instruction, important. Important, important, important. Number two, we've got to provide academic and wraparound support. You say, what do you mean academic support? Well, very clearly that means we've got to ensure that our students who need assistance get the assistance that they need. We have many students who have deficits from the prior grade levels that they were in. So we are working to address those deficits. Our goal is to eliminate those deficits. We have quite a few key students right now who are right there in the middle. They're not always, they're not at the proficient level, but they're right there at that level we call the developing level. And they're just a few points away from being proficient. Our goal is to remediate those deficits so we can bump them up to that proficient level. And we believe that as we do that, we will see a change in our data, a change in our outcomes. More of our students will be at the proficient and distinguished levels, which are the two highest levels of performance when our students take the state assessments. So that's very important. But we also want to ensure that our students are prepared for SAT and ACT and AP exams, et cetera. So we have a, a very um, robust effort to improve the quality of instruction in all of our classrooms, K-12, and all content areas. In addition to academic support, we're providing wraparound support. You say, what is wraparound support? Wraparound support would be working with partners in our community to provide services to our students who may have things occurring in their lives, not necessarily inside the classroom, but things outside of the classroom that directly impact how they respond in the classroom. And so we're working to ensure that if there's family counseling resources, if, they're, if they need eyeglasses or medical uh, uh, health, health access to health care, we're working to ensure that we have partners that can basically provide these type services so our students, when they come to school, they're ready to learn and that they don't have any distractions. It's very important as a community that we work to develop our partnerships realizing that it takes all of us, the classroom teacher, those of us who are necessarily uh, not in the classroom but who support the classroom teacher or teachers, and then those of us on the outside of the school system who have resources or access to resources and services that can be of support to our students as they pursue higher levels of education. So the first area again is instruction. The second area is wraparound and academic support and intervention. The third area is professional learning. We're working to ensure that everyone is coached up to a high level. We want our teachers to be very knowledgeable of their content. The law of the lid says you can't go any higher than the person over you. So if the, the teachers are deficit in content, we should expect our students to also be deficit in what? In content. And so we're working to ensure that if you teach math, that you know math. 
If you teach science, you know science, and you know it well enough to teach students to achieve content mastery. We're also working to ensure that they work on the pedagogy, because knowing one thing, knowing a content area is one thing. Being able to deliver the content area is a different matter. And so it takes both in order to have effective instruction. You've got to know the content, but you've got to also know how to deliver the content. And that varies depending on the de demographics of the classroom, the learning styles of the students, uh, the skill deficits or skills gaps that the students may have. It just depends on many variables that the teacher has to be able to manage in the classroom. Therefore, that pedagogy is most important, learning the best techniques for classroom management, very, very critical to the instructional process. And of course, relevant to professional learning, we're working on ensuring that our leaders have the capacity to lead excellently. We want them to produce high-performing schools, and so we're always working to build the capacity of our leaders. We know that if there's a school that improves, it's because there's a, a good principal at the helm. Improving schools have good principles. And it's our commitment to ensure that all of our principals are resourced, have the training that they need in order to not only improve, but to sustain their improvements. They should improve year after year after year. We want to get away from this regression. We improve one year, then we regress three years. Improve, we got to get away from that regression. And there's a way to do it. We have a framework. Our principals are very much attuned to the framework, the nine characteristics of high-performing schools, and we're working as a system to ensure that every school, every school is implementing those character or has evidence, those characteristics consistently evidence in order to produce a high-performing school. Because when you have a collection of high-performing schools, then you automatically get a high-performing what? School system, school district. And so every school has to be high-performing. So the first area is instruction. The second area is wraparound academic support. The third area is professional learning. And the fourth area is family and community engagement. Our community wants to be engaged. But listen to this. In high performing school districts, families and communities are always what? Engaged. And so you can't say we want to be a high performing district, but yet no one's engaged. That is a misalignment. If you want to be a high-performing district, you got to have high levels of family and community what? Engagement. And so you'll see a very uh, purposeful, intentional effort to engage our community at the classroom level, the school level, at the district level. This is an example of our efforts to engage our community. We acknowledge that we cannot do it ourselves. It takes all of us working together. I reject the notion that it's us against you, school against families. That is, I can assure you, in high performing districts around the nation, there is no such relationship, negative relationship like that. Schools and parents and community work what? Yeah. Together. And it's important that we do that. You say, well, I hadn't had a good experience in the school system. I understand. I can assure you, I've raised four children. I didn't have always a good experience, but I also understood that we had to work what? Together in order to produce success. And we've got to continue to do that. Family engagement, community engagement, very important. Very important to us establishing and sustaining high performance in all of our schools across this district. Across this district. So the first area is instruction. The second area, wraparound, academic support. The third area, professional learning. The fourth area, family and community engagement. And the fifth area, communications, public relations, and marketing. Why is, why is that important? Because we've got to have the support of our community, and we need to have a good image. If you expect, I mentioned earlier, if you expect to recruit teachers to, and we do, to our community, when they go on the news or on the internet, they need to hear good things about our community. People are drawn to successful communities. Let me say that again. People are drawn to successful communities. Therefore, we have to be a successful what? Community. If we want quality teachers and quality staff members, 
We've got to present ourselves in a way that quality is drawn to our community. They see our community as a viable option for them to work, to live, to play, to attend school, for their children to attend school, for them to be teachers and administrators or bus drivers or uh, custodians, whatever role individuals fulfill, we've got to create a culture and an environment in our school system where people say, you know what, I like working in Clayton County. It's a good place, it's a healthy place to work. They have good things going on. Children are the focus there. They're working together coherently toward a common vision, a common purpose of high performance. It is important. Why is that important? Not only that, our community improves. Your home values do what? Improve because people start moving into your community. When they Google places to live in the metro Atlanta area, believe you me, businesses start coming, don't they? It makes a difference. That's why you'll see we've been meeting with the uh, commissioners and the elected officials, met with Chairman Turner consistently since I've been appointed, I met with him today just to talk about, yes, there are certain things we're doing in the school system, but these are the things I need to see I, as I draw and I go out there and we recruit teachers. We need to ensure that when they Google places to live in Clayton, that they find places that they want to what? Live. That's just important. That's the reality of it. We've got to, parks, did I hear you say that? That's important. And guess what else? Let me tell y'all something about the, the, the largest group that we hire right now for our teachers are millennials. They like nice restaurants. Did y'all know? I know, because I've got two. They like nice restaurants. And so if you want them to live in your community, you better, you better have some nice, some places where they can hang out. After they finish teaching, they like to go and what? Hang out. They do. And so it matters. It all matters. It all matters. You know, you, you look at places like, and I'll use Decatur City as an example. Small community, but if you go and drive through Decatur, nice restaurants, places where they can live and hang out. They, and I told Chairman that. These young teachers want to know if, if you want them to live in Clayton, it's got to be somewhere. They're not, they not trying to buy a house to cut grass. They're not. They're not doing it. They're, listen, they, they've, been, they've been raising houses. They're not looking for houses to cut grass. They're looking for nice condos or flats or lofts or whatever you want to call them. And they're looking to make sure that in the area is a place where they can go and shop quickly, grocery shop, but hang out, eat, eat some food. And they're not looking for Burger King. No disrespect to Burger King. They want nice restaurants. And so why do I say that? Because I've got a responsibility, we have a responsibility as a school district to improve test scores, but as we engineer, if you will, this community, everybody's got a responsibility to work together to produce an environment that draws and attracts people that want to live where? In Clayton County. And the school system can't do that alone. That's why, as I share with Tur uh, Chairman Turner, all of us have got to be what? Working together. As people start moving in, and the population is improving, it's growing in our school system. That means we have to look and see where the growth is occurring. We may have to build more schools. And guess what, people? People are looking for nice schools, too. They want modern facilities. And so you should know that as we get through SPLOS 5, we're working on already ideas for SPLOS 6. So new high schools, new elementary schools in certain places, to accommodate the growth of college and career academy, it's just important that when people come, and you know, if you hire teachers, they will come and check you out. Oh yeah, they will. You know why? And they don't sign that contract too easily, because they'll let you know, well, I've got a few other places to visit before I make my decision. Principals, am I sharing the truth? Oh yeah, and if they can go somewhere else, and, 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 and it's sad, but this is the case, they're looking for communities where the children are well behaved, too. So if y'all, I know we love our little, little Johnnies and Susies, but you better make sure Johnny and Susie know how to behave themselves, because if not, teachers will look at, they will pull up the state's discipline data, have it right by, and they'll say, oh, you got too many discipline issues in that area. 
I'm going to go over here to this community. And here we lose good teachers. Look at your neighbor and say, it all matters. It all matters. It all matters. And so that's why we've got to work together to ensure that we have the best teachers, the best principals, positive schools. When you walk into our schools, you shouldn't see kids being disrespectful during instructional time. Kids should be in class, shouldn't they? You see more kids hanging out during instructional time in the hallways than you do in the classroom, something is wrong. And our principals know that is not a characteristic of high-performing schools. And those are just minimal expectations. So those are our areas of focus. A few things that we're, we've done this year so far, uh, we're implementing, we're lining out career pathways to ensure that we're preparing students for some very good careers, STEM careers, uh, this year we're implementing the firefighter EMT pathways at Drew High School and Mundy's Mill High School. We have a new film academy and theater academy at Mundy's Mill High School to acknowledge the film industry that's very much alive in the, uh, in the state of Georgia, in the metro area in particular. We are working to implement, this year is our planning year, aviation programs at North Clayton High School and at Morrow High School next year. We want students to be able to fly planes if they choose to fly, but everybody not interested in flying a plane. Some of them just want to work on the planes. So we'll have a pathways where they can decide the field that they want to go in that will springboard them into uh, some type of uh, job opportunity. We're working to increase the number of internships, apprenticeships that our students have access to. We're working to, as I mentioned earlier, to build a career academy. It won't be in this boss because this boss has two more years to go. We've got some projects already identified. But as we go forward with SPLOS 6, write that down in your notes somewhere. It's SPLOS 6. So when it's time to vote, y'all don't sit at home now and say, I ain't voting for that. I can't tell you how to vote. But I'll tell you this, though. If you don't vote for SPLOS 6, it ain't going to happen because I have no other money. SPLOS 6, we've got three new high schools that we're planning. New Morrow High School, new um, North Clayton High School, and a new Jonesboro High School, which will start in class five and we'll finish in class six. We got a new elementary school in the South area. We got a new elementary school in the King, Ele uh, King uh, Elementary School area that we're considering. Um, a new college and career academy, and some other projects, of course, that are not as large as those those items. But when I say class six, I need everybody to go and vote. I can't tell you how to vote. I vote yes, right? And if you expect this progress to continue, we need your support. We need your support because the truth of the matter is, the only funds that we have available to us to do these capital improvement projects would be SPLOS funds. Our local property tax value are dollars that we collect. Most of that goes into salaries for teachers and staff, so we can't, we don't have the money. So I just want you all to know, SPLOS 6, Vote. I, I don't say how to vote, but y'all know how to do it. But it, it takes a community, right? You say, well, I don't teach, I don't have children. I tell people this, I don't collect Social Security, but I pay Social Security. You know why? Because I saw how it benefited my grandparents, and so I don't complain about it, because I know one day if the Lord lets me to live, I'll be there one day. And so I think Communities, we all give and take, don't we? We make a contribution and we benefit from that contribution. Our contribution is to ensure that our students have access to the very best facilities as we provide great facilities for our teachers and students to thrive in. We will see higher levels of achievement in our school system. I think I may have shared everything that I need to share relative to our work that we're doing right now. I don't think there's anything that I overlooked that I just absolutely have got to share. So at this time, I'd like uh, Jada and her team is going to get the mic. And if you'd like to share, have questions, make comments, we'd like you to do so at this time. Uh, I wanted to reiterate what Dr. Beasley said about uh, retaining staff and especially uh, millennials. Uh, would you all say that this is a very nice facility that you're in right now? I, I, I want to give myself a little pat on the back because 
I was actually, yes, I'm going to give myself a fact because I was a member of the Riverdale Downtown Authority that helped build this building. When I turned 50 years old, I wanted to have a birthday party, but I couldn't find anywhere in Riverdale to have a party at. So I said by the time I turned 60, I want a facility that I can have my birthday party at. So as a member of the Downtown Development Authority, we visited Smyrna, and they had a facility like this, so we built it. However, uh, you all know that unfortunately we had the uh, loss of accreditation, and then we had the problems with our housing. Uh, our goal for this was actually to have, and hopefully it's going to happen, we plan to have townhouses in this uh, area and have businesses, because in Smyrna they have the townhouses open to businesses, so that was our intent. So hopefully uh, we will still have that. That's why I say this is the greatest city in uh, Clinton County, but I just wanted to reiterate that. And I'm going to now pass the mic, but I just wanted to point that out that, you know, you want great things. Uh, we will need a fix, so vote for us, Plus Six. Thank you, Ms. Corey. <laughs> First question right here. Hi. Um, at one of the last meetings, I think the very last one, you, you, you indicated that you were going to define excellent customer service. My question is, have you defined it, and how are you implementing that into the schools? I understand the parents and the community needs to adapt and adjust to that, but we walk into the school system, we walk into them, we want to know how you're going to adjust, adjust, address that so the parents can feel comfortable and getting good customer service. Very good. That's a good question. So have we defined it? Not yet. What we are doing is we're, we're having conversations right now so we can basically define and see these, these tours of allowing us to collect information. But some things that we are, that we already communicated. And our superintendent's protocols that we rolled out this year, we made it very clear that we expect quality customer service. We expect people to be treated with respect, with dignity, et cetera. But we also know as we have some frontline people and we've got to work on some soft skills, if you will. And so we're going to be identifying very uh, specifically those soft skills. Someone walking into the office, we know you're busy, but at least looking up, acknowledging them, and just saying, hello, I'll be with you in a second, instead of the person standing there for 10 minutes before you, you see them, but you hadn't acknowledged them. Those are the things that we're working on. And, and I know because, you know, while my face may be known today, there have been many places that I've walked in and my face wasn't known. And I received the same treatment that you may have received. And Dr. Reed, we committed some funding for that training. Very, that is correct. And so we're, you will see an improvement. And we may even use some secret shoppers. You know what a secret shopper is, don't you? They, they, they have just people that we've identified and just go in and, you know, sometimes you train them to, to, to act a little rough just to see how we respond. You know, that type of thing. But we're going to work, but we'll, we'll define that. Um, because we want to be very clear that we don't. Ex there's no reason for us to exist as a school system if our community wasn't here. There's no reason for me to be a superintendent, anybody to be a teacher, anybody to be a secretary, a custodian, any any position, if it were not for our children being here. And we want to show respect. We want to show and just create create a culture of high performance. And so more to come in that area, but we will be very clear as to what we expect to see in every situation. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not training, as Dr. Smith shared, we've already identified funding, we're providing training and customer service, but I want to be very specific as to what we expect of all of our employees relative to customer service. I have two things to say. Um, the customer service should extend to the parents as well. Because I visit my kids' school quite often. And some of the parents, is they are very offensive. And I mean, it seems like you would want to treat, even though they're uh, employees, you need to treat them the same way you want to be treated. So I think that, that it goes both ways. Not just employees, but the parents as well. Can Mass respond to that? You see the school leadership clapping. But well, we agree with that. But I think it's important that sometimes what we can't do as employees 
is when they come in inappropriately that we ask we got to have de-escalation skills and so that's our commitment to continue to model that appropriate response or behavior and then to help de-escalate a situation so we can get to the really what we need to be doing and that's helping the child and then also acknowledge that sometimes parents come in they're upset they're frustrated because the, the most important person to them is cutting up and so we can't take it personally it's like they're just frustrated that they, that they even have to deal with the situation and sometimes when people understand that then they respond a little differently does that make sense because it's not personally directed at us yes we want them to behave and uh, be be respectful but sometimes it's not personal. It's just that people are experienced and everybody manages that frustration in different ways. And we just have to be prepared for that. Okay, my second question, um, what I mainly came with for tonight was safety and security. Uh, my son, this is his first year in middle school. And I was running late picking him up one day. And he got attacked by another little boy. And most of the time I pick my kids up and for years I've been dropping them off and picking them up. And kids will be fighting, and me as a parent, I'm not gonna watch a child fight. I'm gonna get out of my car, and they don't stop fighting. So, the uh, my kids go to Harper. Dr. Stevens is the principal, and um, so my kids they I have to walk down sometimes if I haven't already made it there to pick them up. But I have seen kids fighting. It's a um, a property that's abandoned across from the the gas station on Valley Hill. Nobody lives there. And the kids they will just fight, fight, fight. I've seen Clay County Police Department pull out and keep going. And so I went to the school, um, to the school, not, not Harper, but supporting middle school, and I did let the SRO know. And he said, once they leave school property, there's nothing that can be done about it. They told me to go to Clayton County. I went to Clayton County. Clayton County said there was nothing they could do about it because the parents don't want to listen, and it's up to them to discipline their kids. So my, my question is, everybody is not as fortunate as me to be able to pick the kids up from school. And some kids may not, they may not feel comfortable, they may not know how to tell their parents that they're being bullied or attacked or beat up after school. So, I mean, what can we do for that? And, you know, some kids, they can seriously get hurt. Kids pick up bottles, sticks, anything. So what can we do to help kids be safe? It doesn't pertain to my kids, but because I'm a parent, it does pertain to me because my kids are affected by it as well. You know, they're all my kids. I participate with all of them. Well, that's a good question. And what, the first thing I would tell you is let your principal know the area because we are building relationships with our police departments, countywide and the various cities. And so we will, no, the middle, no, what I'm saying is, and, and but we need to work with the principal to let us know and our chief of security, I'm telling you, I just had this situation the other day. If there's an area that was a few blocks away from the school, we'll work with the local police to beef up the patrol in that area. Um, and to help us address whatever the challenge is. And so it's a... You, you call who? Refer to our uh, school chief. Okay, he has, he reports to some, he, he, may, he may have told you that, but I wanna make sure that we get it to the highest, the chief of security. saying that it's not the chief of schools for uh, Clayton County Public Schools. Security? You talked to Thomas, okay. Chief, Chief Thomas Trawick? You're calling and nothing was done? But then they told you to come back and see us? But just let us know. You can send me an email and let us work with them to see what we can do to help address some of that. It's just a matter of us coming together. I understand the jurisdictional issue. I understand the timing and maybe after school when school's out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we can still, as a community, we have to work together to figure out a way to ensure that our children are safe. That doesn't mean the parents don't have a responsibility. Clearly they do. But if there is an area that clearly kids are fighting in consistently, then I just believe all these adults with all these brains, we can figure out a way to get, get that solved. Well, I, um, I just remember our partner got a You can't control every spot. I got you. <laughs> You're a good one. <laughs> but we appreciate you.
and they actually dumped the child for dead last last school year the, in September. They dumped the child up for dead. He was having seizures, and another child had enough punches to go and get an administrator. Everybody else, it was like 20 kids out there. They left him out there. Well, and you never know, and that's why we got to keep working together. So, if you have another concern or another area, let us know. We appreciate you too. Hi. Hi. My name is Tisha Lewis. My son is uh, in the third grade at Church Street Elementary. Mr. A Mr. West is the principal. <laughs> um, I think sometimes we get on to talk about the negative stuff so much, so I want to bring something positive, okay? He's been there since kindergarten. I have been very blessed, highly favored with each of his teachers, his principal, the parent liaison, the PTA. I am very well, well I'm just amazed at the school. There's been growth. Uh, I'm just, I just wanted, I was very nervous about Clayton County because before I even moved to Clayton County, that's when uh, they lost their accreditation. I was very nervous. Of course, I did the, um, I went and Googled. I was like, oh my gosh, what did I do? <laughs> but since day one, I have been very impressed. Um, last year, the students were walking something kind of like what she's talking about. The students were walking home to the apartments where they live in. There was no pedestrian walk for them. Do you know the principals? They walked the children home. They took it upon themselves. They didn't have to do that. They had plenty of work to do, but they walked the children home. So um, this this is what's right with Clayton That's County. Effectively and this is what is right. Mr. Principal, good job. Thank you, leadership. The um, Morrow will be a, is a, is a new school construction that we're planning for. Jonesboro is a build, a tear down, build up over phases. And North Clayton hopefully will be a brand new school. So that probably will be, a, uh, depending on how we have to do it, it could be possibly a tear down, a tear down build up. Um, so our goal is, is to demolish most of the old schools. The Morrow high school campus, we've got some other ideas for the use of that facility. Okay, and another thing, uh, not the superintendent before, but superintendent before that was the last one. Uh, we had uh, male involvement, we had something called Men Standing Gap. See you got superintendent, area superintendent back there, and I, I loved it, it was a great idea, it was going well. Uh, you say family, a lot of times you say family, most of us just think about uh, mothers and children, but you have to get male involved. That's right, that's right. That's right. So, uh, when the superintendent left and died, we've been sitting here, so I think you need to get It's being out. resurrected. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. As, a, as a matter of fact, Dr. Simpson, you want to please speak to it. So. Oh, absolutely. And, and you're speaking of, uh, you know, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Dawkins. Yes, sir. Um, that was an effort headed up by, I think, uh, Mr. Bivens, Charlton Bivens, who was a board member at the time. And so I met with him probably about a month and a half ago, and I'm well aware of that organization and the work that they did. Um, previously, in a district that I used to work at, we accepted a call to action to the My Brother's Keeper Initiative. That's, uh, of course, up under the former President Barack Obama's initiative. And so we'll be bringing that to play. But in addition to that, this coming Friday, I think it's this Friday, all of our schools are participating in the Million Fathers March to School. And so that's, okay, you're, you're participating, for, thank you. So that's just a, a kind of a brink of the iceberg. I mean, that's just more, to, there's more to come, certainly. But one thing we want to do under My Brother's Keeper Initiative, certainly, is to address all of the challenges that are facing all of our males of color. And that's elementary, middle, and high school. So look for that to, uh, to, to be coming very, very soon. But we've already started planning phases. And this is probably going to be um, men standing in between the gap on steroids. <laughs> yeah, one more question, right? Uh, oh, as far as uh, you were talking about family engagement, and like I said, I, Mr. Face, I'm newly elected principal. Mr. Face, I had two kids elected at school and stuff, and they're doing well. Uh, but like I said, we go to Clay County School, it's not like you might have one that's like, they just knock it down, and then you have one it's just night and day. And so, how can you assure that? I'm not, I'm not saying it's going to be exactly the same. 
but if I go to school, it shouldn't be night and day when come to family engagement. Well, I'll tell you this, and that's why my job is to ensure that we have quality principals at every school and that they know exactly what the expectation is. And so if you are seeing that much variability, you need to have a conversation with myself, Dr. Simpson, Dr. Smith. You need to have a conversation with us. Um, but I would always say, always let the principal know, ask some questions. That's part of that engagement. You know, I go over here and I see you know, all this activity going on. I come over here and it's like, it's like it's quiet. It's, and so have the conversation with the principal. I, I like to always give that principal an opportunity to hear and to address. But don't stop there. You got to give us a chance to work with our principals and others to make sure we work to eliminate any variability. Now, everybody may have their different styles, but they still should have engagement, right? There you go. At least have a style. Hi, my name is Clyda Crumbly. Um, I'm the parent of Dylan and Dakota Crumbly. They go to Church Street Elementary with Mr. West as well. And my reason for being here was well, definitely because I have small kids. I own my home, so I don't plan on leaving. Um, but um, of course I'm worried. That's why I'm here. And I'm glad that you know we have someone new with more, ener more energy and people that say- They say it. too much energy. I heard no, that no, today. No, no, definitely not. But that's OK. I'm good. I'm good but, um, I do want to say that you know I have a lot of friends that have kids in private school and say this and this. And I hear all kinds of things about Clay County. But I can honestly say I'm worried about my kids after they leave Church Street, only because I have a sense of community with Church Street. Um, even if I have, you know, my success stories may not be as great as Ms. Lewis's, but they're just as great, only because I have a parent liaison and I have a principal who are on it. And I'm the type of parent, I'm extremely involved. I will be up there in a second. You need some help. I'll do that. I'll volunteer to do this. But I, you know, I create that rapport with them so they know that if they need me for other reasons besides my children, because I'm not just here for mine, I'm here for all of them, um, that, you know, they listen to me. I mean, and, and they'll let you know. I'm, I'm not an easygoing parent, but I, I'm on them. And they know that what I expect of them is 100% in behavior, because that's something you can control. Everything else we can work with. But I can honestly say that, you know, Church Street has been a blessing for me because I was definitely worried. And I've been in my house since. I lived in Clayton County before in Jonesboro, but I moved here nine years ago. Dylan was a couple months old. And I was really worried about him starting school. And I think the first year, there was a female, um, a female principal, but she was leaving as I was coming in. Met Mr. West, and I thought, okay, this is going to be good. But I really, if we have parents in the room, it's very important for us to be engaged and know that they're here to benefit our kids and give them the support that they need. Um, and also, if you don't have a parent liaison, I know I have friends that are in Fayetteville, Fayetteville um, County Schools, and they don't have parent liaisons. And I'm like, well, I have to get y'all one. Because Mr. Smith, <laughs> he'd be on it. But just to have that type of rapport, I just really, really Really appreciate them, and like Miss Lewis said, I would see kids walking with no coats on. Mr. West, wear your coat. Mr. Smith, wear your coat. You better come with your coat tomorrow. You know, so that sense of community is just wonderful, and I just pray that everybody can do that in Clayton County because I don't plan on leaving. I need to say. We're committed to ensuring that that's your experience, K-12. Yes. Yes. just want to actually connect with you. I had the same concern. Uh, we've been involved with Church Street for years. Solomon's now 14, so my concern of going from Church Street, because they're so loving and nurturing, going to Riverdale Middle, you continue your involvement. You go to the open house, you introduce yourself, you meet all the teachers. It is a different kind of place, and you hormones change, and things are a little bit different, but I, I was where you are. I understand that concern of going to elementary school to middle school and the next year he's going to high school. So I'm nervous again. <laughs> but I have uh, two daughters at Church Street um, and then Sarah will be going to middle school. So it's, it's really, it starts at home. To me it always starts at home. And um, how we reach out to our teachers and to our administration and they are so receptive. You know, so receptive. So continue doing what you're doing but then continue doing it in middle school when it's time for them to go. That's right. 
right? Very good. Hi, uh, my daughter goes to Riverdale Elementary and my mom is very involved and we both would like to know how come there isn't more openings in the magnet programs. Um, we're very curious about this because I was doing some research about the graduation rates, which in a magnet school is 100%. So we're really curious as to why there's not more openings. I was told there's only 20 openings um, at Jackson Elementary for each program in the arts. And there's hundreds of applications and I'm just, I want to know how come there's not more magnet school openings and also what can we do to make sure that there are more. That's a good, a good question. I, I think one of the, the, the main challenges relative to the programs you mentioned is space. Because what we don't want to do, we have to do a balance. We want to open up seats, but we don't want to have to open up seats and add a lot of trailers to the school. So schools are built for certain sizes, a certain enrollment, or, or certain capacity. And so space always comes into consideration. And, and we have to balance the number of seats in the magnet program with the number of students who are actually resident students community. So that's just a constant battle, if you will, that we've got to manage. But we're looking at a few programs uh, as we as we think about relocating a few programs that may provide us more opportunities to increase the number of seats. We're looking at a few additional innovative programs at a few other schools to uh, create more theme schools. And so you'll be able to hopefully this time well before this time next year, you'll see some more cho choice and options available to you in the system throughout the district. Hello, my name is Stephanie Oliver, and you may be familiar with my name. I've reached out to you two times, and I want to thank you. You have responded with such a quickness with my concerns. My daughter attends Stillwell, and I love the school. Uh, parents are involved. It's a magnet school. My daughter grew up. She went to Jackson and moved on to MD School of the Arts, and now she's in Stillwell. And I know the sense of community because that's a different environment. Uh, the parents are committed. They care what's going on. You know, when there's PTA, sometimes it's a stroke getting the masses in, but there are um, parents that are like anchors to the school. But I wanted to thank you with the situation with my daughter and the bus um, over here at Riverdale. Uh, where they, that's one of the locations they take the children to Stillwell and it was overcrowded and I let you know the concern not just for my child but the other children on the bus and you responded quickly with that and I appreciate your attentiveness to that and like everyone is saying it's not just the teachers it's us too and I'm very involved I have my daughter's in 10th grade now and I have a kindergartner now so my thing is, it's up to me. I got to make it happen for my child. I just wish other parents, just by the show who's here, children who's interested in what is it that the parents are not understanding that this is important. If you want your child to go far, you have to take the initiative. It's not on the superintendent, the teachers, the counselors. What are you doing? So I ask you, I'm a member of an organization that we're in. We serve Clayton Henry, we serve Henry and Clayton County, but I know we try to kind of help bridge the gap as a community partner. So I offer my organization, if you need assistance from us, that we can, you know, have the masses come in and try to do what we can. Very good. And that's exactly what we, we want, those type of partnerships. So see that gentleman right there? Make sure he gets your information, okay? Thank you. Um, how you doing? Um, I think I'm kind of the um, odd right, man out because it sounds like everybody living in this community. I don't. I don't. Um, I'm on your email, and I haven't been to any other meetings. So I decided to try to come to this one, as you can see. Um, I have a child that's at MD. I have a child that's at Lovejoy. Uh, but my main question, and it's a general question, and I've been a kind of vocal advocate of this pretty much since they started public school, um, coming from a, I guess, a private daycare. Why is it so lopsided for us? Let's say I'm going to use the elite as an example, because I've heard several times that okay, well, you can't compare your school to elite 
because it's a different program. But I can say yes, I can. Why? Because they are all public school venues, and I know Elite has a tougher um, curriculum. However, my question is that what are we doing to make sure that those same types of curriculum, they don't have to be on the uh, same level, but I expect the same type of learning, type of environment, that my child is not being left, left behind, any other child is not being left behind, because like it or not, we all take the same, we mean the kids, take the same GMAS test, but you have some that kind of underperform, you have some that outperform. And there's a big gap right there. You know, so that shows there's a problem right there. And um, like I said, we can preach till the darkness come home that yes, lead is in a more stellar environment per se than other schools. But my question is why is there such a big gap? I know you're just on board, and uh, I can see from the emails and from the uh, uh, people that I've spoken to and people I've heard about that you actually are actively involved in the community, so that's good. Uh, you've uh, kind of, you, you've been a pretty busy man, put like that. Because uh, you, uh, you seem like you are genuinely in different places at different times. You have different avenues for the parents and whomever to come out and uh, say their piece. But see, uh, as I said before, this stuff really should start from the elementary, well, from kindergarten on up and make sure that no child is uh, lagged behind. Because you shouldn't have to uh, bust your behind trying to get into elite. Well, trying to get into Jackson, et cetera, et cetera. And what I'd, I'd like to do is, I appreciate your comments, but I want you to know that you will not see a, a difference in the quality of instruction from elite and other Jones, Jonesboro High School or uh, Lovejoy High School. Let me tell you what the difference is. Uh, at Elite Scholars, everybody there has to have a three point something GPA to stay there. At Lovejoy, that is not the case. If I took everybody at Lovejoy who had a, the same GPA as what's required at, at uh, Elite, you would have a comparable situation. So it's just you got two different dynamics that are going on. They're getting the same access to AP classes. They're getting the same access to a rigorous teacher, good, high-quality teachers. But you've just got a different, a different uh, set of uh, context. The context is different. If you, let's say, at Lovejoy, you got about 1,800 students, right? Elite scholars, 6 through 12, you got about 600 students. All of those students have to maintain a certain GPA requirement. It's not that they perform any better or worse than the kids at Lovejoy, but Lovejoy's data is different. You know why? Because out of those 1,800 students, you've got a lot of kids who have the same GPAs or higher than the kids at Elite, but you've got a lot of kids who may not. Um, and that's work that clearly the principal there has to continue to work on, but it's comparing apples to oranges. At Elite, the parents have got to be involved in order to remain there. At Lovejoy High School, that is not the case. And so the principal is dealing with a different set of circumstances and variables that he or she is managing. But I can grant you this, if I pulled out the data for everybody, for those kids with the same GPAs as the kids at Elite Scholars, you'll see no difference probably in the outcomes. No difference. But the principal still has to deal at Lovejoy, has to still deal with those kids who may have a one point GPA that he's got to figure out some incentives, if you will, to get those kids to, uh, to maybe study as hard as some of the other kids. It's just a different context. That's no excuse, but it's, a, it's an acknowledgement of the reality and the difference of what's happening. You know, what, what has to happen in order for a kid to remain at elite scholars versus what has to happen for a kid to remain at Lovejoy High School or some of the other high schools. The Elite Scholars, for example, has a 100% graduation rate. That alone tells you. And some of our other schools, the grad rate is, is we're, we're, we're getting close. I know Riverdale, and you should acknowledge Riverdale, they have an 80% grad rate, the third highest in the county. <laughs> but I grant you, if Ms. Miller Brown had the same context as elite scholars, she'd be at 100% grad rate too. But she can't, she can't withdraw a kid whose GPA is below 3.0. I don't give her that option. Does that make sense? So it's a different context. But am I, is, is that to say that the teachers at elite teach higher and higher levels than the teachers at River, Riverdale? No, it's not the case. She just has a different set of variables and expectations, parameters that we, and things that she can't do that may be a little different for this magnet program over here. 
That's the difference. That's why sometimes magnet programs look like they thrive versus those who are not magnet because of the, the context, the expectations, and what criteria the students have to meet in order to be entered into the program or to remain at the program. Now, if I put that type of criteria in at every high school, I'd be at 100%, but you'd have a whole lot of children not in, not in school. Does that make sense? And so you got to understand that. And that's important for us to understand. Does that mean that we, want, we don't, we don't want to work to ensure that 20% that at Riverdale's graduating? We want to get that 20% graduate. But I also understand what her context is. And so if I can get her to go from 80% to 83%, because I know she can't put them out if they have a low GPA. Does that make sense, everybody? And so I've got to work with her a little differently. I think we have to understand that and, and realize that each situation is a little different. There's some things that are at play that impacts those outcomes. Well, I mean, I hear everything you're saying, mm -hmm. and I agree with some things you're saying, something I disagree with. Okay. Because, I mean, common sense to me will tell me that I know there's always going to be differences. You're always going to have a low end. You're always going to have a high end. But my main concern and I'm generally speaking, I can't speak for all the parents in here, but I speak on a general standpoint that it would uh, kind of meet everybody for us. What are we doing to try to bridge that gap between that low end to the high end? Because we know that elite has its own you know, environment. We know that Steelwell has its own environment. However, you also know that you have fewer slots for people of the community to get into. So why are you not using those sister schools that you have there, which do have some of the AP classes, however, they are limited also. You know what I mean? Because the whole point behind it is that everybody's trying to get a quality education for their child. But nobody shouldn't have to be kind of uh, faced with uh, statistics. Okay, well, I'm in a lottery here, or I'm only, I'm, I'm only having uh, 75 slots here. You know, when it should be kind of like on an even plane, bring, it, bring that plateau up higher to bridge that gap. So my question is, what are we doing to address that? We know that, uh, that uh, who is, I think, Morrow and, um, Morrow and Lovejoy, they have two major programs that's up, 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 uh, ongoing or is coming up, but they start out initially with 75 slots. I get that, it's a pilot program, but we need to look at expanding that, and you have spaces within those schools, where why can't you adapt some of the spaces in the schools to help with some of that old flow? Therefore, you won't have that crowd that's trying to get into elite. You won't have that crowd trying to get into steel wheel, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I'm mostly concerned about. And that's Don't need those others behind, yeah, just that's because. A, that's a good point. And, and of course, clearly, we, we are looking at all of this, the uh, magnet programs to see if there are opportunities to increase the number of seats, et cetera. But even if we increase the number of seats, we still have to deal with the reality that we've got to deal with some students who we need to close the gap, as you say. We need to get those students reading and doing math on or above grade level at all of our schools, some schools more than others because of the situation that may exist. But we're working to provide interventions to those students. We are, principals are doing credit recovery. Principals are working with parents to make sure they're coming to school, make sure that they're behaving themselves so the teachers can teach. You know, all of these are variables. But and remember, school choice, you know, that gives us options. But oftentimes, when we create these, 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 these school choices, sometimes communities don't want to hear this, but you take all your high-performing kids and you put them in one school, and don't be too shocked when all your other schools have below-average performance, at least until you can change the outcomes at those schools. But those are the pros and cons of having magnet here and magnet there and choice here and choice there. Yeah, we want all the kids to read and do math on or above grade level. I want every school to be at 100% grad rate, every school to be at 100% proficiency rate. But the truth of the matter is, teachers, if a kid comes to Riverdale High School in the ninth grade, but they're reading at the sixth grade level, teacher can make about one year's worth of progress in a year. And so principal has to work with that teacher to get that kid as close to ninth grade as possible reading at ninth grade level before he or she takes the test in April or May. More than likely, it can happen, it can, but if there's several years behind, more than likely, we just expect some growth to occur. And that's just the reality. 
When everybody starts coming to our schools reading on or above grade level and maintaining on or above grade level, we won't be having this conversation. I agree. No, we we agree. We agree totally with you. so we can address that because every student should have access to foreign language. Contributing to those gaps. Very good. Oh, sorry. Uh, Next question. Thank you. Uh, I have to go to Church Street too. I have two boys. But um, I had a question about the parent involvement in part. Um, with the PTA, because I'm part of the PTA there, um, how are you going to incorporate that? Because that's a, a, you know, a great way for parents to be involved, but how are, are, do you want to see the PTA so that they can? Um, help you get more involved and working closely with the teachers and the principals? Well, we've set some goals to increase the, uh, the number of parents who are involved in PTA. We've set some goals to increase even the number of active PTAs as identified by the state PTA. And so Dr. Simpson and the assistant superintendents are working with principals to support the PTAs to get more parents involved, realizing that um, Parents like to have options, not only just PTA, but they want to be a part of clubs and, and things of that nature, boosters and bands. And, and so we're just working with all of our schools to get more parents involved at the classroom level. One way we can get some uh, parents involved is we can get them, if we can get them going to Infinite Campus checking grades. That helps. It helps a whole lot. Uh, if they want to know about district-wide announcements, we put the announcements in the platform to make it a little convenient for them. And so that's one way of getting them involved. But working with your principal, I think that's the key to, to be creative and innovative about how do we get our parents engaged. And sometimes that means you go to them, which means instead of having a meeting at the school, you may have to reach out to some of your, your homeowner associations and your apartment complexes and see if you can host a meeting over there. And so just to be creative, and let's, as we've shared with so many others, don't expect everybody to come to you. Figure out a way to go to them. And that takes a little energy. It takes a lot of energy. It takes building relationships and partnerships. But it's doable. And so we just, I'd encourage you and all parents to just work creatively and innovatively with your principals to do that. We want to see our parents engaged. Um, but figure out ways that they can be engaged. And give them, a, give them credit for the small things, or things that appear to be small but are very, very much huge. Check an infinite campus, returning a phone call of a teacher, or calling the teacher, or emailing the teacher. To me, all of those things are engagement. Okay. I just wanted to make a comment um, again about um, 
you know, things that are going on at school. My older son, um, he's had a very hard time in school until this year, and um, he just happened to get, I say it's the best teacher there, but um, he has a really awesome teacher who thinks outside the box um, and has helped him go from being a D average to an A, like straight A's. And this is the first year, and of course we celebrated big time in my house. But um, I also just want to let Mr. West know, and I let Mr. West know about the teacher, um, that you know I really believe it's him who has encouraged his teachers to think outside the box and um, do things differently because my child definitely needed that because he never came home and talked about school. Um, he was very disappointed in um, school because he was struggling constantly. And this teacher has opened him up um, allowing him to come home and enjoy school and he's excited about going to school and talking about school and making straight A's and he he loves his teacher and I just wanted to let you know that's another positive thing that's going on. Very good. Thank you for sharing. Excellent. Hi, I'm Regina Deloach and I just wanted to make a comment in reference to growing your PTA. As we market and brand our county, reach out to your neighbors and ask them, even if they do not have small or you know little ones in school, ask them just to come out and be a part of your PTA. Ask them just to come out, even if you're having a PTA meeting, man your table, make donations. So that's a way of just pulling and, and growing as we you know continue to grow our community brick by brick, school by school. Very good. Thank you. Okay. We have time for two more questions. Or not. Okay. Thank well, you, thanks everybody for being here. We look forward to seeing you at other events. I hope this was informative. I know it's very informative to me. And we appreciate the partnership, the collaboration, and let's continue to work together to achieve higher levels of performance for all of our students. Thanks everybody. Enjoy, get home safely.